Okay, so what I want to do today is look at um, what the internet means as a diagnostic device. So I'm first going to talk about what I mean by the internet, which isn't as self-evident as many people seem to think, and then turn to what is meant by diagnosis, though I probably won't say very much about that because I think all of you know a lot more about that than I do, and finally what the internet means for diagnostic practices. So in other words, the question I'm addressing is, does the medium matter for diagnostic categories, practices, and consequences? And if there's time, I'd also like to talk about how the internet may affect the research practices of medical sociologists themselves. Now this may not be the right moment to mention that I was a little bit surprised to receive this very kind invitation um, on behalf of this very illustrious consortium. Um, because, you know, I don't know, God, what do I know about diagnosis, I asked myself. In fact, what do I know about health? Um, in more self-confident moments, I remember that together with Fliss Henwood, who many of you know, we did some kind of quite early empirical work about how people use the internet to find health information. And more recently, as Susan mentioned this morning, together with Susan and Anna Harris, um, we've been looking at the online direct-to-consumer selling of genetic tests. Everything I know about genetics, I learned from Anna and Susan. Um, but I still feel very, you know, with you real kind of practitioners, um, health sociologists, I really feel a bit like um, I'm out of my depth and I don't kind of know things, and there are lots of words I don't really know how to pronounce properly, but okay. Um, <coughs> what I do feel more confident about is um, that I know something about the internet. I've been doing research about the internet since long before we called it the internet. Um, and in the year 2000, uh, Fliss and I, Fliss Henwood and I, um, applied to the ESRC and Medical Research Council for our project called Presenting and Interpreting Health Risks and Benefits, the Role of the Internet, which was under the auspices of that wonderful, innovative health technologies program, and of some other people in the room were lucky enough to get money from that as well, directed by Andrew. And um, to my, somewhat to my surprise, I was able to find the application, because this was the year 2000, so of course it wasn't lurking around on my uh, hard disk anywhere. Um, and this, I'm not going to read this aloud, I'm assuming you can all read. Um, this was um, from, these are the first two sentences of our uh, proposal. And um, I think this is incredibly interesting with hindsight. I mean, I'm not being, you know, I was just uh, getting a bit old and nostalgic. Um, but it's interesting, I think, for two reasons. One was our very deliberate positioning of the internet as an innovative health technology. Now, partly we were applying for money under the Innovative Health Technologies Program, um, that certainly played a role. But in keeping with my year 2000 self, um, I also want to claim today that the internet is an innovative diagnostic technology. Second reason I think those couple of sentences, which I could probably still use and try and get money, um, <laughs> is um, that the popular claims about more reflexive, informed, and empowered patients still abound. Um, possibly even more so with the advent of social media. Now, in some ways, this is incredibly depressing, given the amount of um, extensive and detailed empirical work done by many, including people in this room, and at least one round of boom and bust in terms of expectations about the transformative potential of these sorts of technologies. So I must admit, I'm, you know, I'm a good kind of academic sort of person. I um, have always been rather skeptical about the transformative claims that are made about the internet then and now. But nonetheless, Fliss and I were convinced that there was something going on, um, that the internet may indeed change how people found information, what kind of information they found, how they understood it, what they did with it. Um, and we were also convinced that claims about the internet were themselves making a difference, not least in health policy. But we also reckoned, recognized that there had been no shortage of health information prior to the internet. It wasn't like, I mean, this is the kind of ideal image, you know, you have the internet, you plug people into it, they then become informed, enlightened, rational, and all sorts of good things. Um, but the reality is often a bit messier. There have always been lots and lots of sources of health information around. Um, uh, you know, people have long had access to magazines, self-help books, leaflets from public health agencies, um, little leaflets that come with the drugs, not to mention, you know, mothers, friends, colleagues, and health care, health care professionals themselves. So, what is the internet? Um, now, at the risk of sounding like um, a lecture for first-year students, the internet is not the same as the web, 
It's not the same as Facebook. You all got that? <laughs> Uh, the internet is a network of networks uh, that links computers and lets them communicate in a common language or protocol so that it appears as a single network, even though it endlessly branches and connects in complex ways. It supports a range of services, including email, file transfer, the World Wide Web, Facebook, and all sorts of other things. So it's not just a communication medium or a bunch of content with no physical substance. It's a very large complex technical system involving satellites and routers and servers and cables and search engines and access devices. Um, and it involves many different actors, you know, large hardware companies, the telecom companies, software producers, new media content providers, regulators, and all of us generating content probably on a regular basis. These are various kind of representations of, of the internet. There are many, many more. And it could have been otherwise. Um, there were alternatives uh, for transferring bits around in the 1980s, and the future might also be different. So in case you haven't already guessed, my background is in science and technology studies, and those last two statements were kind of classic statements of science and technology studies. Now, even though I've um, been saying internet as if it was singular and homogenous, it really is something that is multiple and varied, which I think is still not fully grasped, neither by the public nor by researchers. And it's very tempting, however, to continue to use the singular for the ease of speaking, I should probably continue to do so. But I'd like you to keep in the back of your minds that it's a complex system, and there are differences between the different kinds of applications on it. And I will come back to this and the importance of media and media and technology literacy later. So what did Fliss and I learn from our early work about the ideal of the informed patient or the reflexive consumer? Now, the ideal image is that patients will take it upon themselves to become informed about their own health, and the conditions, the available treatment options, and doctors will listen to the patients, and you know, there'll be this nice kind of rational kind of negotiation regarding appropriate treatment that takes into, the val uh, takes into account you know, the actual physical conditions and the values and interests of patients. Now, we found three important constraints on this happy picture. One, um, many patients don't actually want to take responsibility um, or seek out information for themselves. There are many reasons for this. People trust their doctors. Um, they're really actually quite ill um, and not in a state to do this. Um, various other reasons. Secondly, one of our, many people, both, and we had a little bit of discussion about this this morning, um, both um, patients and practitioners lack skills and competencies in media and information literacy finding information, understanding the context of its production, interpreting specialist literature, just because you can now read The Lancet online doesn't actually mean you can understand it, understanding risk, uncertainty, probability, or complex um, phenomena for everybody, lack of awareness of sources, lack of understanding of the difference between source and medium, um, and I mean these sorts of conclusions have come out of, of lots of other literature as well. And thirdly, Practitioners are not always that keen on fulfilling their end of the bargain. Um, we did sometimes find instances of kind of you know model informed patients who were then dismissed or ignored by their doctors, especially when lay knowledge doesn't coincide with expert knowledge. So the cynical leaflet I once saw that talked about, and I quote, empowering patients to comply with treatment. Um, <laughs> is, uh, sadly, um, perhaps not an exception. <coughs> so Sarah Nettleton and Roger Burroughs came to similar kinds of conclusions in an article that they published in 2003 when they argued that the nature of information in the digital age may actually work against the possibility of acting as a reflexive agent. So following Scott Lash, they argue that discursive knowledge, which implies a set of beliefs, values, and disciplinary underpinnings, has been replaced by informational knowledge, which exists outside the systematic conceptual framework. So when people engage with health information accessed online, they come across bits of information that have become decontextualized or disembedded from the wider knowledge base from which they came, which also makes it more difficult for people to assess the legitimacy and value of the information. And search engines can work to obscure the source of information, or at least make it more difficult to identify. Now what has changed since we did do that early work a decade ago um, is the rise of social media. Um, this is an incredibly helpful explanation for the old people in the room who haven't quite grasped all the difference um, between different kinds of social media. Um, 
now you should understand the difference between Instagram and Foursquare. Um, so I think you know, there's been the rise of social media, user-generated content, that was always there as well, um, and this injunction to participate. And participation can mean many different things. Rating your doctor, rating the car parking facilities at the hospital, sharing details of your health, illness, treatment, reporting symptoms of infectious disease on a health map, reporting drug reactions, the example that uh, Andrew gave this morning, um, providing genetic material and self-reported phenotype data to a company like 23andMe, which uh, Anna and Susan and I have been looking at. Nonetheless, I think the conclusions from our early work pretty much stand. People are sometimes reluctant to take on this role of an informed patient because they still trust their doctors or because they're still really ill. Um, media literacy is not much better and possibly even worse as the internet has become increasingly black boxed. Um, and practitioners might still be a bit reluctant to engage with informed patients. Now, we didn't explicitly consider diagnosis and self-diagnosis, although implicitly it was part of what people were doing when they went online to look for health information. And in the work with Anna and Susan about direct-to-consumer genetic testing, the diagnosis is more prominent. Though, as with most genetic testing and research about it, genetic tests blur categories of risk and disease, um, of diagnosis as category and as process, so I'll now turn to diagnosis. Um, now I'm not going to explain this because I'm sure you all understand this much better than I do, um, but clearly it's a very important kind of process, um, outcome for individuals, for professions, for epidemiologists, for governments. Um, at all levels, it provides explanation, demarcates patient and medical authority, allocates resources, but as we've heard today, you know, it's historically contingent, socially constructed, changes over time and place, and affected by the available knowledge, technologies, and prevailing social, political, and economic relations. So we've already talked about this very useful special issue, social science and medicine, and the very useful introduction written by Sarah and Anna-Marie Anna -Marie Patel, who distinguish between diagnosis as category, diagnosis as process, and the consequences of diagnosis. I won't go through that um, here. So one of the reasons I put this, you might recognize this picture. This is from your website. It was on Susan's opening slide this morning. Um, it was, I think it's a great picture. I'm going to use it again, um, subject to Welcome Institute. Uh, that's where it's from. But what's really interesting from it is, uh, is even though you've used it for the seminar, and you, these are computer screens and those are mouse wires, there's very little discussion of the internet and digital technologies in the description of this seminar series. Um, I think there's one reference to e-health, and then it just kind of goes on. So what I want to kind of turn to now is how does the internet kind of matter um, in uh, all these kind of manifestations of diagnosis. So as I say, diagnosis is this complex interaction of people, bodies, information, expertise, instruments, classifications, tests, measurements, it takes place in multiple set settings, including the clinic, the hospital, the lab, and the home. Now, this is all very well known, but what seems less well known and less researched is how digital technologies, in all their multiplic multiplicity, are affecting these interactions and processes. So I found this introduction um, from, by Sarah and Anna-Marie incredibly useful, but they also don't pay much attention to processes of digitization, which I have to say was rather surprising given some of Sarah's earlier work. Um, so even when they discuss how the world has changed um, between... Uh, Mildred Blackster's 1978 article in which she calls for more attention to the sociology of diagnosis and the 2009 um, article that we've um, already heard about today um, when she was make, trying to make sense of her own diagnosis. Um, anyway, when, in discussing that, Anna-Marie and, and Sarah kind of make this kind of grand claim. Now there's no mention in here of how digital technologies um, uh, which are intimately bound up with processes of post-industrialization, neoliberalism, globalization, marketization, and nor is there any reflection on how patients get this expertise and knowledge. Um, and I've got a little note to myself here. If I'm feeling mean on the day, uh, I'm feeling mean, um, I will point out that they also don't discuss what these big words mean. Um, globalization of what? Trade, production, capital, labor, um, post-industrial in one small part of the world, um, in 
The UK, in this case, means rapid industrialization elsewhere, like China and Brazil. The Netherlands, where I now live, has never been industrial in the sense that the UK has. Lots of ways to criticize that sentence. Um, but none that, you know, they do recognize, um, and many of the contributors to that special issue, the important role of instruments of classification systems, such as the ICD and the DSM, of how these can change relationships between patients and clinicians, between different types of medical expert, between the pharmaceutical industry and public health care systems. So it's rather surprising to see how little attention in the special issue as a whole is given to technologies of information and communication. Yet diagnosis is an activity of information and communication exchange par excellence. Healthcare pro uh, professionals you know, have to listen to patients' descriptions of symptoms and experience, have to listen to their bodies, have to observe behavior, um, bodily fluids, um, which are more or less easily accessible. And they often do this in conversation with other professionals, cognizant of the constraints imposed by government policy, healthcare systems, insurance companies, and the pharmaceutical industry. So it's an incredibly information intensive uh, process. So what do internet, uh, the internet and digital technologies mean um, and what do they add to the sociology of diagnosis? Um, I don't think you can read that, it's kind of lost resolution. I didn't have this, this I also had from our earlier work, um, but not digitally. Um, so you've got a healthcare professional uh, sitting here and one of these apparently uh, helpless little old ladies um, sitting there with lots of computer printout, when we used to do it that way, saying, I'm sorry, doctor, but again, I have to disagree. <laughs> um, but I think digital technologies, taking them seriously, could add to the sociology of diagnosis by kind of helping us to answer these questions of when, where, who, and what, um, or as it's discussed in that special issue, place, temporal anomie, self-diagnosis, and information. Um, so, Anna Maria and Sarah already identified time and place as important new directions for the sociology of diagnosis. And I'll start um, there. So they, they point to shifts in power, expertise, and authority between clinic and the lab as a result of new forms of testing, whether blood or cells, taking diagnosis away from doctors and increasingly placing it with lab technicians and researchers. It was interesting listening to Katie um, just a little while ago, and you know, sometimes that's one person um, kind of taking on those different roles. But what they don't mention is that digital technologies can disrupt spatial relationships in, other sort, in various ways. So, for example, as Nelly Adshorn and Jeanette Pulse, separately, um, they show how telemedicine disrupts the spatial relations of healthcare. And Andrew mentioned this um, also this morning. Um, but it's not only that telecare shifts the care from clinic to the home or from hospital to a telecare center. Um, it also means that much important diagnostic information is stored in cyberspace, to use a very mid-90s kind of word, and in spaces in between, such as databases, digital images, electronic patient records. And some of this data is available to multiple actors, including patients, and some of this data is extremely difficult to interpret, also for professionals. In terms of time, um, it's a nice article by Olson in that special issue about people's reactions to their spouse being diagnosed with cancer. And she introduces this notion of, temp notion of temporal anomie, um, the disruption of time experienced when people diagnosed with serious disease such as cancer, and how people have to you know, suddenly reassess their future in light of this rather unpleasant present diagnosis. But what isn't discussed there, um, but does emerge from other work on patient professional communication, is the importance of the timing of giving information to patients. Um, healthcare professionals, much my line group, you know, do give a lot of thought, most of them, to what kind of information people need to have and when. Um, they sometimes might get it wrong, but they do kind of think about this. The internet, in most of its manifestations, disrupts any great plans doctors might have about this. People can now find good, bad, and different information at any time of the day or night, which can disrupt care and treatment tra trajectories, as well as the effect of psychosocial processes of taking in difficult information. Which brings me rather neatly um, to self-diagnosis. So I've been reading a lot about diagnosis in recent weeks, um, and even by medical sociologists, to make a grand generalization, it does seem to be the preserved professionals. And there's lots of interesting work done about um, how diagnosis is learned, um, how it's kind of important in the establishment of subdisciplines, the role of classification, and all sorts of things. 
But a lot of what kind of ordinary people are doing when they go online is self-diagnosis. They have a problem and they want to know what it is and how it can be treated. So in Evelyn's contribution to this special issue of social science and medicine, she looks at the checklists on websites and quite rightly, I think, argues that pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies use such devices to promote self-diagnosis as part of marketing campaigns to brand not only particular treatments, but also diseases themselves. And she also suggests that self-diagnosis has received relatively little sociological attention. And there's a very fine line between direct-to-consumer advertising, testing, and self-help, um, all part of the commodification of, kind of pre-illness and the medical consumer. And the internet is very important, I think, in this process and needs more attention. Um, okay. So, but the final point about the right information at the right time and the importance and the consideration of affect. Sometimes people don't want to be informed. Um, and the sort of both the policy and I think often the sociological injunctions to be informed, rational, active aren't always terribly helpful for people who are really quite ill. There's this wonderful book I can highly recommend by Chloe Atkins called My Imaginary Illness when she describes her experience of living with an undiagnosed condition that often left her paralyzed and unable to breathe. And she recounts how the difficulty of finding a diagnosis led many healthcare professionals to assume the illness was imaginary. And this follows her around, this label and diagnosis, with the result that she's often denied reasonable physical care by those who should be providing it, and also denied respect and sympathy. Now, at some, it's a very interesting one. At some point, given how she reacts to a particular drug, um, they think it might be disease X. So she and her partner set off along the internet in search of a diagnosis. And she describes how this can be helpful. But nonetheless, she also describes how she doesn't want to engage in this process, feeling overwhelmed by all this information at a time of physical and emotional fragility. As Anna Marie Moll in recent work has very effectively said, information is not a substitute for care. Um, I'm getting a little worried about time. Um, so my opening question, does the medium matter for diagnostic categories, for practices and consequences? The short answer, of course, is yes. One doesn't have to fully kind of buy into the celebratory discourses surrounding the internet and web 2.0 to recognize that the internet has all sorts of potentials, and potentials are not probabilities, we need to remember, but it does have lots of potential to disrupt the temporal and spatial dynamics of uh, diagnosis and care to disrupt patient-practitioner relationships, to disrupt professional relationships, and to bring into play new knowledge power relations. So I just want to spend, I know we started a bit late, so I'll take a few more minutes. I want to now um, talk about the internet as a tool for <coughs> medical sociology, something rather different. Um, so not only of the internet as an object of research, but also as a research tool for medical sociologists themselves. Um, Now, three days a week, um, as uh, Susan mentioned this morning in the introduction, um, I'm formally responsible for what's called the e-humanities group of the Dutch Academy of Science. Now, for this 19th century institution, humanities includes social sciences. Um, and it, from that, and I'm sort of responsible for kind of digital humanities and social sciences within the academy. And it's quite striking, actually, that colleagues in the humanities do seem to be experimenting a lot more with what digital technologies may offer in terms of how research is done and how it's presented, in terms of text mining, enhanced publications, for example. Now, you could say they have more suitable material. Um, you could also say that so far, um, it's interesting to see these battles are beginning to emerge, but so far, I think humanities scholars have been less caught up in the relative virtues of qualitative and quantitative methods that sometimes uh, dog uh, social scientists. Um, now, I think. Some, uh, you know, pharmaceutical industry, um, the genetic testing companies such as 23andMe, Google, have all seen the potential of enrolling people um, in either to sell them drugs, to sell them diagnoses, to turn people into pre-patients, um, to collect data from them to do research, to aggregate data to do all sorts of interesting things, or to develop new forms of epidemiology by looking at what and where people search. I think you can see this very well. Are you all familiar with Google flu trends? Um, 
Google now claims it can predict outbreaks of flu by um, aggregating search engine data. So, you know, if everybody in Exeter tomorrow kind of types in flu, they reckon there must be an outbreak in Exeter. I mean, that's putting it a bit crudely, it's a bit more complicated than that. Um, so if you, you can try this at home later. Um, anyway, that's a map of the Netherlands and for the last kind of few weeks. Um, all very interesting. I mean, this is it's very problematic. I won't go into details of this, but um, that's, you know, companies are doing these kinds of interesting things. Um, so what are we as social scientists doing? Um, and I want to leave aside the debates about big data, transactional data, the end of theory, um, no longer needing to rely on what people say because we can finally know what they do. Um, I want to kind of talk about this much more mundane level. Can we sometimes use the, all those kind of wonderful research tools out there to do interesting things? Now again, another kind of STS uh, health warning. Technology mediates and structures researchers' interactions at all stages of the research process, just as it structures people's efforts to find and share information about their health. Um, so what I've got here, these couple of slides, I won't go through it in any detail, but it's a very kind of crude representation of the research process, um, the kinds of digital applications that might be relevant, and the kinds of critical questions we should be asking ourselves before we try this at home and draw big conclusions on the basis of using these sorts of things. Um, now, looking at that wonderful special issue of social science and medicine, um, the only visible innovative use of digital methods was by Leslie Pryor and his colleagues. What about Lindsay Pryor? Did he do anything? Ah. <laughs> Lindsay, sorry. Oh. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, they uh, used text mining. Sorry, I'll let you quickly look at this and then I'll show you the nice pictures from their article. Um, they analyzed 54 interview transcripts in order to check for co-occurrences between terms, such as flu jab and side effects. What they were interested in was how people talked about flu. Um, so they had these two really, really nice pictures. Um, and we can talk about uh, later how this is actually done. But anyway, so you're looking for co-occurrences between uh, terms. And the program calculates the coefficients for all the co-occurrences and displays them grammatically. Now, of course, this is heuristically interesting. Um, you can use it to check the veracity of your analysis. You can capture a lot of information very concisely. Um, you didn't actually say if you found this helpful or useful, um, and whether it revealed things that you might otherwise have missed. But you do point to some of the problems, like a computer can't always distinguish between what the interviewer said and what the respondent said. But that seems to me a question of tidying up your data before you kind of submit it. Um, and often the, the Visualization, visualizations generated by PIAT, the uh, program used to do that, is sort of random. Um, so, I'm almost done. Um, so I was kind of using this as a kind of thing, okay, could we do other things? Um, are there other kinds of <laughs> possibilities of using the technologies to do kind of interesting sorts of things? So for example, text mining self-help guides um, to look at changes over time across countries, the differences between material targeted at particular groups or particular diseases. Now, of course, it could be completely trivial. Um, and just because one can use a computer, it doesn't mean one should. Um, but it could be an interesting experiment. Can one, and you know, the technical tools are there, look at hyperlinks between different sites online to see if this bears any relationship between real world connections and relationships and those that you can find out online. Now, this can be done at an organizational level to look at man from NICE is gone, um, to look at, you know, if you've looked at the NICE website, you know, all sorts of tools around to look at all of the kind of in and out links that NICE has, which could be interesting and generate certain kinds of at least research questions, but it can also be done at a kind of conceptual level, looking at words and, and semantics. Could also perhaps um, look at new forms of representing results. Um, now, within science and technology studies, one does have to be very careful uh, with radical reflexivity, um, as not everyone is as talented as Anna Marie Moll or Steve Woolgar. But you could, I imagine, um, write an article or an enhanced publication about the sociology of diagnosis that's written in the form of a diagnostic protocol or in the form of a checklist that had different kinds of routes through it. Now, you don't actually need particularly advanced tools to do this. Um, you could do it as a kind of tree diagram or 
they think it could be fun to try at home. Um, or something I've been thinking about doing for a while um, is a visualization of the DSM and how its categories have changed over time. Um, which is actually, I think, not particularly difficult for people who know how to do these things and could sort of show some very interesting things about changes in diagnostic categories. So, I think I may have got a bit of a time. Um, thank you. Thank you.